As most of our regular subscribers know, I have been fascinated uh, for many, many years with this whole idea that the speed of light is not a constant, but slowing down. And I'm debted to my friend Lambert Dolphin, who first introduced me to that idea. But clearly, one of the real pioneers of this thought was a gentleman by the name of Barry Setterfield, who makes his residence in uh, Australia. And uh, his writings, of course, have been very, very controversial, created a major, major uproar in the field of physics. Most classical physicists have a great deal of difficulty in dealing with this. I think that's uh, not surprising because uh, the speed of light was regarded as infinite during the days of Descartes and otherwise. And it was Olaf Romer, the Danish astronomer, that first actually found a way to measure the speed of light. And his results were just disputed out of hand for 50 years by physicists until uh, James Bradley, an Englishman, confirmed his results and people began to realize that the speed of light was, it, it did travel at a finite speed. But the field of physics, of course, has clung to its belief structures just as tenaciously and emotionally as any other field of, sci- uh, of, of study. But in any case, Barry Setterfield, uh, much vilified by many, was the first to really unearth this possibility that the speed of light's been slowing down. It's still controversial, but extremely provocative because it really addresses many of the paradoxes that occur in astrophysics in general, and certainly in terms of the biblical believer who's constantly struggling with this issue, gee, were we created in six days, and and, uh, how could it be that we see light traveling from 50 million years ago and all that sort of thing? So it's a basic, basic issue that uh, we wrestle with. So I have uh, been uh, fascinated with Barry Setterfield's studies and observations for many, many years. And I was delighted that on a recent trip to Australia that I had the opportunity to actually meet with Barry. Now, Barry has the burden of uh, dealing with an autistic, epileptic sister. So he finds himself unable to you know, be away from her. Uh, so it makes his travel very, very burdensome. And for that reason, he doesn't have the visibility that many people wish he did have. It was just really through his writings. But he did make our special arrangements while I was in Adelaide to come see me, and we spent a delightful afternoon. It gave me a chance to hear from him personally the remarkable aspects of his discoveries and also to confirm what I had heard, that he's just a warm, committed, believing Christian guy. And I just had a wonderful afternoon, and we did record it, and we thought you would enjoy joining us for an afternoon discussion with Barry Sutterfield. Tell me how you first encountered and dealt with this whole issue of the speed of light issue. That's this whole business of the possibility of the speed of light not being a constant, of course, is the uh, primary you know controversy that uh, tends to surround your name because you were mm-hmm. early in alerting the world to that possibility. Mm-hmm. How did that first come up? You want to tell me about that? Do you really want to know that, Chuck? Yes, mm-hmm. yes I do. <laughs> okay, it came in two sections, really. I was alerted to this by an experience that I had back in uh, 1973. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me just backtrack just a wee bit, Chuck. What happened was that when I I became a Christian when I left, uh, just at the point of leaving university, I had to leave because of ill health, which is why I haven't got any formal degree at this stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Someone said to me, Barry, you're an unqualified success. (laughs) (laughs) That's a a clever (laughs) double entendre, isn't it? It Mm is. I... uh, thought uh, when I became a Christian, I thought God had done it through evolution. And then as I started reading the Bible, I found that, okay, ten times in Genesis 1 it said to, to, they were to reproduce after their kind, not change from one kind into another. And as I read the scriptures, I saw in passages like uh, Isaiah 11, the lion will uh, eat straw like the ox, the lamb will lie down with the kid, and none will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Mm-hmm. And I thought, hey, this is God's normality for the animal world, not nature red in tooth and claw, not the survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. So I had to change my ideas about evolution. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, to satisfy my long geological ages and my long astronomical ages, I I moved to a position where I thought, okay, uh, each day in Genesis has got to be a geological age. Mm -hmm. And then in the tears of despair one night, Chuck, I found that that didn't work either scientifically or scripturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I moved back to the only other alternative that I knew, which had been presented to me by Dr. J. Sidlow Baxter in his work. Exp- J. Sid- yes, okay. Yes. J. Sidlow Baxter is quite a, yeah, he's a legend, huh? Okay, so uh, anyway, I fell back onto uh, a gap theory. I put, uh, I said, okay, there's this time gap between verse 1 and verse 2 in Genesis 1. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I put all of my astronomical and geological ages in there and uh, 
Genesis uh, 1 and 2 was the reformation of the earth to make it habitable right. for man. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you're familiar with the, mm-hmm. with the story there. Mm-hmm. But um, And I taught it that way at high school uh, groups, for university groups, for scout groups. I taught it like that at um, Sunday school and, and so on. And uh, I said to uh, one of my friends who said, OK, well, if, what about the, uh, the geological column? Can't you account for all of that by the flood? I said, look, I have hassles with that. But even if you could account for the whole of the geological column by the flood, there's one thing you can't get away from. These galaxies that we see 5,000 million light years away, it's take, taken light 5,000 million years to get here. So this, the, uh, the universe has got to be 5,000 million years old. There's no way out. Mm-hmm. That was the end of the argument for me. Mm-hmm. And I went on quite content that I had the truth that mm-hmm. way for a number of years. And then on the night of the 11th of January, 1973, it was a Thursday night, as I remember it, about half past ten at night. <laughs> I felt <laughs> obviously, the obviously a key milestone. Yes. 11th of January. 1973. 73, okay. At half past ten at night. <laughs> I felt the Lord walk into my room. I couldn't see him, but I knew he was there. I felt his presence Mm-hmm. And uh, I heard his, his voice talking to me. And I argued with him, Chuck, for four whole hours about the Bible, science, creation, and evolution. <laughs> and he slaughtered every argument that I put up. He left me totally without any defences at all on this issue. And by the time he'd finished with me at half past two in the morning, I was totally convinced that, OK, everything was created in six literal days of 24 hours each in the recent past, certainly less than 10,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, he said, all right, he said, at half past two in the morning, he said, you're tired now. I was mentally exhausted after arguing. <laughs> Your hip didn't hurt, though, did it? <laughs> no, <laughs> only my head, Chuck. <laughs> Talking about Jacob rushing the head. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, you'll have other questions to ask after, and I'll come back and answer them. So I went to bed fell asleep. And the following morning, I looked out of my window as I woke up. A part of the curtains, I could see parakeets flying between the pine trees. I thought, hey, I wonder how Adam felt to have pterodactyls fluttering around his head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and suddenly, the whole creation seemed such more, much more intimate and personal. And um, then it hit me. My basic argument... These galaxies that we see 5,000 million light years away, it's taken like 5,000 million years to get here, so the universe has got to be 5,000 million years old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, I accept all you told me last night. I can't do anything else, but I can't see my way through this one. And in that instant, I heard his voice shoot back to me, the same way as he'd spoken that previous night. He said, Barry... Why do you assume that the speed of light has remained constant? I've heard that part of it. That's why I was curious. I wanted you to get into this a little bit because yeah. it really was from that point you really started this investigation, wasn't it? Well, the investigation didn't start until some time later, Chuck. I held that at the back of my mind as a potential answer to some problems. And uh, I thought, OK, we could, if we have to go into this, we can knock it over in a couple of weeks. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I left it there. I didn't push it. I had uh, other things on my mind at the time. And uh, anyway, it wasn't until uh, December of 1979 that someone gave me a, uh, a massive book for a Christmas present. It was entitled Mysterious Universe, a Handbook of Astronomical Anomalies by William Corliss. And 800 pages or so. As I flipped down the index to see what was in this thing, I saw the, the heading constancy of speed of light question my ears pricked up I thought hey what's going on here and I flipped back to those pages and there on those pages were documentation from the scientific journals in the 20s 30s and 40s that the speed of light was dropping 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 with time and there's a whole blow up in the scientific literature about this I hadn't been told about that at high school or university. I was told the speed of light was constant. And yet here's this discussion going on. Mm -hmm. And my response was, wow, what God said is true after all. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, you little faithers. Uh (laughs) And it was from that time on, Chuck, that I started to investigate this. Mm -hmm. I had the physical proof in my hand that what I had been told by the Lord was true. And I moved once I had that physical proof. Mm -hmm. And I've moved on that ever since. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me how you then proceeded. I'm very interested in this. Okay, well, I started looking at some of the scientific journals that uh, this was discussed in. And uh, 
by the time we got to, I guess it would have been 80, 87, our report came out. I had a number of ad interim uh, conclusions which mm-hmm. I put out uh, in the meantime. Uh, nothing had been absolutely set in concrete at that stage. The first report of any substance, of, of the major substance, came out in, in 87, where all of the data that was uh, available had been documented, not only on the speed of light, but on also the other associated atomic constants. Mm-hmm. Because as we looked at this, we found out, OK, if the speed of light is changing, other unfortunate things are going to happen unless energy is conserved in the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you conserve energy in the process, you find that all the measurements of the associated constants are actually moving in the predicted way. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, the, the movement of the other atomic constants, and there are about 16 or 17 of them, uh, they show... Mm-hmm. Well, there's evidence of their moving, as you're pointing Yes, out. yes, they, example, they're, they're moving lock sync with the speed of light. Give, us, give me some examples of that. Well, for example, the uh, Planck's constant H. Mm-hmm. Um, it turns out that HC, H times the speed of light C, yeah, right. is an absolute constant, Chuck. Why? Uh, we have measurements from the most distant galaxies about this. Okay. Okay. Because, see, that's, the, that's where I've been fascinated with the possibility. If the speed of light's been slowing down, my presumption is it probably is tied to the Genesis 3 mm. and, 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 and in terms of entropy. The entropy mm-hmm. of light, the, con, you know, the product mm-hmm. of them being constant. So, mm-hmm. so the speed of light slowing down ties to this mentality that that's also when... when you're speaking of Romans chapter 8, the bondage of decay yes. and all of that. That's yes. why I've always linked that de- the, the speed of light's decay as part of the de- a derivative... I mean, if, it, if it's correct, then it's probably a derivative byproduct of the curse from Adam's sin. Mm-hmm. And that just fascinates me, because we know... Everything we know about the creation is post-curse. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's, always, that's why I'm open to this kind of a perception, and I'm always amused at this incredible uh, reactionary attitude of so many physicists that they, they don't even really want to examine the data openly, which I'm always amused by the non-objectivity of scientists. You know, they, <laughs> they're just as emotional as anybody else is, you know. Yes. So, now, some of this involved collecting data yes. from history. Yes. And how did you go about getting raw data from way back? You know, what, the okay. speed of light's been measured, what, 143 times in 300 years? Or uh, about 160 times, Chuck, in uh-huh. the, uh, the last 300 years. Uh-huh. And uh, what we did, we, we went back into all of the... Um, all of the documentation that had been given from the experiments that had been done and so on. Uh-huh. And, and those are available, you can find those. Yes, yes, this is, this is all... Uh, in fact, I, I had the Flinders University Library, interna- uh, interlibrary loans working flat out for me for a couple of months. I got to know them pretty well. In fact, uh-huh. in my report there, I thanked um, um, a couple of... Ian and Kay and a few of the others who'd worked there so hard for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when the report was finally out, and I gave a copy to the guys at the interlibrary loan, I said to uh, Ian, well, there it is, finally. I said, look, we've given you some credit here. He said, Barry, it's been a pleasure to be working with you on such a controversial topic. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they realise, huh? Yeah, so we had uh, something like three or 400 references uh, in there to all, mm-hmm. these, all the work that had been done. And okay. So it wasn't only just the speed of light references. We had a lot of references to Planck's constant and many of the other physical associated with physical constants. That, that's the other loose end I wanted to track down because I've heard that assertion. I'd like to understand some of the other physical constants. Is there historical evidence that they've altered? Yes, there is. And all, that's what I was curious all about. The, all, the measured, all of these measured values, Chuck, are moving lock sync with the with the changes. Over what of period of time? Uh, how back? Far, how far back do we have? Okay, reliable right. evidence for a Physical constants changing. That's okay, right. see, the physical constants were only known in their present form at the beginning of this century. Beginning That's what bothers yeah. me. In other words, yeah. I assume that trying to infer changes earlier than the century is probably pretty tough or pretty pretty well, tenuous. Well, on the other on the other physical constants, yes, but on the speed of light, no. You see, some. No, of I mean, on the physical, I'm looking for non-speed of light kind of yes. data that is yes. supportive. You yeah. See. Okay. Well, the other physical constants for this century are moving in the same way at the same rate of change as the uh, as the speed of light. Now is give me some examples. I'm just fascinated by that. I think okay. it's very very um, fundamental to our case here. Yeah. Well, one of the the major things is, in fact, as I mentioned before, Planck's constant, and that has mm-hmm. changed. That has absolutely increased there is no question about it as you look at the the raw data there has a systematic increase in in Planck's constant over this century interesting Interesting. absolutely incredible and as far as the speed of light is concerned itself there have been uh, let's see something like 15 different methods by which it's been measured Mm -hmm. each one of those methods in itself shows a decay when you put all the methods together despite the statistical scatter of points that you have there is still a decay 
Michelson, one of the uh, uh, the key. Uh, yes, I want to hear about him because he's he did that at the Naval Academy. I'm a Naval Academy graduate, so I've got yes. to know about Michelson. Yes. yes, yes. Well, Michelson, he did four determinations of the speed of light. The first two were with the same equipment. The second two were with the same equipment. In each case, the lower value for the speed of light came with the same equipment on the second de- uh, determination. Mm-hmm. And the first group of experiments had a speed of light considerably higher than the second two group of experiments. Mm-hmm. And so Michelson himself, in his, in his data, showed a systematic decay in speed of light. And the point was that on the second determination, with the same equipment, it was registering lower. Now, this is not just with Michelson. This has happened three other times. Yeah. Uh, you had um, well, Peace and Pearson, you had... Um, Foucault, you had some of the others. They they, they measured uh, they measured the speed of light with the same equipment mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at a later date. Uh, not only was Michelson working uh, 1873, the same year you had uh, Simon Newcomb working independently to determine the speed of light. And at the same time you had a Russian working on the speed of light by a different method again. Within 12 months, each one of these determinations had come out. Mm-hmm. They were within five kilometres per second of each other. Mm-hmm. In, and that was 1873. In that's, that's surprising accuracy. Of course, that was, that was 1873. 1873. That's, wow. that's, that's surprising accuracy for that early. It is. Well, I mean, I, today they, it's quite a different thing, but back then that was you know, that, that's impressive. That, that is impressive. Mm-hmm. And the, this made an impression upon Professor R.T. Burge and... Uh, Burge, writing in 1942-43, he said, would have been 42, he said, the results obtained by Newcomb and Michelson and those other experimenters around about 1870 to 1880 are consistent among themselves, and yet they, their average is 100 kilometres per second higher than the current values of the speed of light. Mm-hmm. So he admitted that there had been a change in the, the measure. I values. see the point you're making. I catch you exactly because a different method, same time, etc. Cl- uh, close c- uh, congruence of their, of their yes. measurements, and they hadn't been liaising with each other in any way. And yet, at the same time, measurably sig- significantly uh, different than today, or, um, or, or subsequent measures. Yes, yes right you. And interestingly enough, Simon Newcomb himself made a comment about the earlier measurements around about the 1700s. He said, these older measurements of the speed of light are about 1% higher than the current values. And he had to admit that despite the fact that he didn't believe in any change in the physical constants. Mm -hmm. And he admitted that the early values in the 1700s, the early 1700s, were in fact 1% higher than in his own time. And then history repeats itself when the measurements that Newcomb made were 100 kilometres per second higher. Sure. Now, over that, now that's a long time ago, 100 years ago. Uh, at this stage, I gather the measurements are getting increasingly asymptotic somehow, aren't they? So the, amount, the degree of change is, is, is becoming minuscule. But is, it, is, is there even a change, a measurable change in, in very recent history? Yes. Now, he, here's where we can come into uh, another method of measurement, Chuck. Uh, because the speed of light, uh, the, the, the change in the speed of light affects all atomic processes... The atomic clock, the, sign, the way that scientists measure the ages of the rocks, mm-hmm. the planets, mm-hmm. the fossils, the stars, it has various ways of being measured. Mm-hmm. Um, the atomic clock, in all of its various forms, when the speed of light is higher, that was ticking faster. Mm-hmm. So when the speed of light was ten times its current speed, the atomic clock ticked off ten years in one ordinary year. And so this moves lock sync with each other. Okay. And the problem has been, over the last... Ever since 19... Roughly around about 1955, mm-hmm. atomic clocks have been used as standard equipment in laboratories. Mm-hmm. And so when you measure the speed of light using atomic clocks, you cannot pick up any change. Because, because the, the yardstick's moving the same direction. Exactly, you gotcha. yes. You know, I should share with you, uh, I was on the board of a company called Datum, a public company, and we acquired a company in Boston called FTS, Frequency Time Systems, whose primary claim to fame was cesium clocks. And I remember that board meeting still vividly. Bernie uh, uh, Horowitz was the, was the president. He was excited about this potential candidate acquisition. And he told us about the season clocks and how they're apparently, as I recall, accurate to one second within 100,000 years. Mm-hmm. And I raised my hand as a board member and I said, uh, Bernie, I only have two questions. Uh, my first question is, how do you know? And everybody laughed. <laughs> the second question is, 
who cares? <laughs> you know? And of course, how do you know, it became a, a discussion of the molecular behavior and all that business, and okay, I, I, I conceded that. And then the question of who cares, it turns out, of course, that uh, time precision uh, derives uh, it, from that you derive navigational accuracy, mm -hmm. and uh, that's not obvious unless you've been a navigator. The time is crucial to p positioning, Absolutely. and so of course these season, the, the, these clocks are the very uh, backbone of the global positioning satellite system. Yes, and we were very early in that game. But I remember that board meeting very well because I got a lot of chuckles with the board. But it was a relevant question as a board member. This all sounds great, but you know what's what's the real relevance of all this? And uh, and so I remember that. Now that, that I understand the point very clearly. You're saying that. That as the speed of light changes, the intrinsic atomic behavior is altered, and therefore the clocks are in lockstep with that. Mm -hmm. uh, which raises another question, um, and this is a hard question to frame intelligently, but is it possible that it's not the speed of light changing, but the nature of time? It's the nature of atomic behavior which is actually changing, Chuck. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can we just leave that question in the bones just for a minute? There's a couple okay. of points mm -hmm. I'd like to make about uh, these clocks and so on. Um, the Interesting thing is that Van Flanden, Dr. Thomas Van Flanden from the U.S. Uh, Naval yes. Observatory in Washington, uh -huh. back then he was a director of the um, U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, and this is back in 83, 84, sometime in there. And he, for the best part of 10 years, had been measuring um, and noticing the difference in measurement between atomic time and dynamical time, which is the time that it takes the Earth to go around in its orbit mm -hmm. once or the timing of astronomical phenomena. Or a solar or a sidereal kind of movement yes. that we, we call dynamical time. That's right, yeah. Okay, I got you. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, dynamical or astronomical time or ephemeris time. You mm -hmm. have the three. They're all talking about the movement of astronomical bodies one way or another. Van Flanderden picked up in that 10-year period that there was a discrepancy in the run rate between the two clocks. And he published it in... Uh, a U.S. Uh, Bureau of Standards magazine that, uh, that came out. There was a conference about the constants. Um, I think it was called um, Atomic Phenomena and, uh, and the Constants, I think, something similar to that. Uh -huh. And uh, that was back in 84 that came out. And in that, in that big um, pa pamphlet that was uh, put out by the U.S. Bureau of Standards, um, Van Flander made a very interesting comment. He said, if these measurements have any significance at all, it means that the atomic clock, that atomic time, is slowing relative to dynamical time. And if the atomic clock is slowing, it means that the speed of light is dropping as well. And he was picking that up with the atomic clock, a comparison of these two times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, you can, do, you can push this a bit further, Chuck. Knowing that the atomic time is affected by the speed of light or vice versa... You can then start looking back into the past, into history. You have dating of historical objects mm -hmm. in historical dates, comparing it with atomic dates that you're getting for these same objects. And you can make a cross-comparison. And you notice a very interesting thing. As you go back into the past, the speed of light, the atomic clocks were running faster and faster and faster. They peaked and they started going back down again. And this is picking up an oscillation in the behaviour of the speed of light and oh, the atomic wow. clocks. Mm -hmm. And as you do this, you find that there is a peak round about 500 to 800 AD, and it came down to a minimum, and this is what, what something I was discussing with Lambert only about, about a week ago, two weeks ago. It comes down to a minimum round about 1980 AD. And this is another reason why everything was tapering off, getting much, much slower. And this is why we hadn't been, hadn't been able to pick up so much of a change in the speed of light back, that time, back at that time. Both for two reasons. A, it was slowing down to a minimum. And secondly, the atomic clock was employed. And uh, as a consequence, you weren't picking up any change. So there were those two reasons. And the other associated constants, uh, which are not being like the Hall resistance, for example, as you measure that, you find that that Hall resistance uh, is changing in such a way as to indicate the speed of light must have been increasing after about 1980. Hmm. And uh, there's another way of doing this Why as well. Why would it be increasing? That puzzles me. OK, we'll come to that, uh, to mm -hmm. the solution to that one in a minute, with, along with your other question. Um, the other thing which uh, was, uh, was affected by this was the, uh, the rate of rotation of the Earth. That, that in itself is a, a stabilising clock, a stable clock 
relatively stable. I should say relative because it isn't smooth either, is it? It isn't smooth, but there's one thing which has been very, very noticeable, Chuck. Ever since 1980, they have one-sidedly added leap seconds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because is that the, run, a... the run rate of the atomic clock compared with the dynamical clock, the, in this mm-hmm. case the mm-hmm. Earth's rotation, has changed. Mm-hmm. And with adding leap seconds to the, to the clock means that the speed of light must have been increasing from about 1980. We mentioned that in our newsletter, but I don't think we recognise the significance of it. That's interesting. Yeah. And so since then, there's been an increase as you translate that, um, the number of leap seconds that have been added and so on, as you translate that into speed of light terms, there's been an increase of something like 11 uh, metres per second in the, uh, in the speed of light since around about 1980. What is the significance of that increase relative to entropy? I don't believe that... In, OK, this comes back to the basic cause of yes. the whole deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it gets back to your original question there mm-hmm. and, and so on, and why there should be this oscillation. And that's what my recent paper is all about. This is the one okay. which we've just uh, submitted to a uh, secular scientific journal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the one that we've got the um, layman summary all about. Mm-hmm. Well, all right, how does it all work? This comes back to... The behaviour of the vacuum, mm-hmm. when the speed of light... The basic properties of the space. The basic kind of, properties mm-hmm. of space, gotcha. yes. Permittivity and permittivity and all that. Hmm? Yeah, permittivity, mm-hmm. permeability and mm-hmm. all the other properties of space. Mm-hmm. Um, when those properties change, the speed of light inevitably has got to change. Mm-hmm. Now, this comes down to what we know about the vacuum. And it's only in relatively recent times, scientifically that there has been sufficient information about what comprises the vacuum to be able to make some intelligent... uh, to have some intelligent understanding about this. Back in the 17th century, if you had a flask which you could perfectly seal, you took out all air, took out all gases, took out all liquids and all solids, they considered that you had a vacuum. That was known as the bare vacuum. Mm -hmm. Um... They found out later that that vacuum would transmit light, but it wouldn't transmit sound. Today, scientists don't use the term bare vacuum. They use the term the physical vacuum, and there's a difference. As they experimented, they realised, okay, that flask, what we now must do is surround it, make it a perfectly sealable flask, uh, and so that it's entirely temperature-proof, so that when you pull out all your heat radiation from in that flask, so that that flask is a perfect vacuum down at absolute zero of temperature. So they've got to get to zero degrees Kelvin. Yeah. yeah. They make a discovery. There is still an intrinsic amount of energy within that vacuum. Within every cubic centimetre of the vacuum of space, there is an intrinsic amount of energy. It's called the zero-point energy Mm -hmm. because it's there at absolute zero of temperature. I understand that part of it, yeah. Okay. Right. That zero-point energy is absolutely ginormous. Um, It has been estimated as being... Some estimated as being infinite. Others say, no, 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 it is finite, but it's very large. I subscribe to that second deal. Uh, for reasons which are outlined in my paper. But um, the sort of orders of magnitude that you're talking about is something like of the order of 10 to the 95 to 10 to the 100 oh, really? ergs per cubic centimetre. Mm-hmm. And that's one followed by 95 or 100 zeros. That is the amount of energy intrinsic within each cubic centimetre of space. And this, uh, this energy manifests itself Um, because energy can be converted into matter and vice versa. You have the current view is that you have virtual particles popping in and out of existence, particles and antiparticle pairs. So you have an electron and a positron Mm -hmm. forming Mm -hmm. and annihilating within a very, very short period of time. Okay, that is one view. The other view, which is slightly more recent, is that view is known as um, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, the other view is a stochastic electrodynamics. Okay. This is saying that the energy there in the vacuum is made up of a whole series of electromagnetic waves, mm-hmm. which, is, which is a sort of an irreducible noise. 
mm -hmm. uh, in your vacuum so that you have a number of experiments that you can do. For example, if you put an electron, suspend an electron in a vacuum at absolute zero temperature, the electron does this sort of thing. It jiggles around. Mm -hmm. It's called jitter motion, or in, it actually goes by its German name, Zitterbewegung. Um, is what? Zitterbewegung. Zitterbewegung. Yeah, it's interesting. The, yeah, it mean, literally means jitter motion in, sure, sure. Okay. in German. And uh, so... The, the way that this is explained, uh, you have one way of explaining it on the QED model, you have another way of explaining it on the SED model, the stochastic electrodynamic. On the SED model, you have all these waves impacting on the electron from all different directions and jiggling it around. This is essentially what's happening. You've got, um, they call it the seething vacuum. You have... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, this has one... This has got some... Um, there, quite apart from the electron, you, you have another way of showing that this, this um, energy is there. If you take two parallel metal plates and bring them very, very close together, there is a force collapsing the plates. Mm -hmm. What is happening is that... That's distinct from electrostatic force? Yes, distinct, quite distinct mm -hmm. from electrostatic forces. This, is a, this force actually goes as, as to the fourth power. All other forces are, uh, can be shown to be different powers. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, this force, it's, it's called the Casimir force. It's known as the Casimir effect after Casimir. Hendrik Casimir from Philips Laboratory over in the Netherlands, who discovered it back in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it turns out that on the SED model, as you bring these plates closer and closer and closer together, the only wavelengths which are permitted to exist between the plates are those with wavelengths that are shorter or uh, shorter than the, uh, the average distance of those plates apart. As a wavelength. Okay. As wavelengths, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that means a whole host of waves are being excluded from those plates. And those waves exert a radiation pressure. And that pressure is what is pushing the plates together. So here you have two experiments to show that this energy actually does exist there in space. Now how does this tie, if at all, maybe it has nothing to do with this, I may be mixing apples and oranges, but can this, does, does the relevance of the experiment of Alan Aspect and his colleagues at the University of Paris, where they dealt with the Bell inequality, this mm -hmm. whole business of, of non-locality, mm -hmm. does this relate to this at all, or is this really a different issue altogether? It is possibly a separate issue, Chuck. Okay. It possibly is. Because one of the most bizarre discoveries in recent years is the realization that these subatomic particles have no locality, that they're immediately connected somehow. Yeah. And this whole, our whole perception of reality is thrown out the window as we begin to realize that this whole thing is, is almost like th that our physical universe is a holographic simulation somehow. Yes. There is, in fact, a link in this. Okay. Uh, remind me about that question a bit later. There, okay. is, a link, there is a link in this because uh, they, you can show that they are communicating at possibly what was the original speed of light. Ah, there we go. Because Now, that's interesting. That's interesting because, because that's part of the mystery is that these things... The Allen aspect experiment, the nine and a half centimeters, all that business, really led to that, there, that these particles are somewhat communicating faster than the speed of light. But that's the speed of light today. Yes. That I, the idea that there might be gravity waves or something else is a whole other conjecture. Who knows? Yes, so then, yes. Yeah. You see, Van Flanden's recent work uh, that's just been published in uh, Physical Review Letters A, I think it was, uh, he pointed out that the speed of gravity... Uh, as determined by his calculations uh, and the measured values that he's getting uh, of the of the, of the uh, constant that he's putting in there uh, is very close to what I'm getting from my redshift values for the um, uh, the original speed of light. Now let's stop for a second but, because yeah, we'll, we'll stop there, right there, at that there, point. There's a tremendous issue to bring up here. I assume you're talking about William Tift and the yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come to okay. we'll come to them in a minute. That, that that's all last. Okay. Uh, that all follows as a result of your question about the... Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. This is fun. I'll, I'm, I'm, you have no idea how I treasure this time. I've been looking forward to this for so long, and I, I appreciate your taking the patience to tutor, tutor me on this. This is wonderful. It's a pleasure to do this. So getting back to the vacuum, then, and the energy that's there, um, it's very interesting. The It turns out that Every atom in the universe is actually su supported by this zero-point radiation, zero-point mm -hmm. energy. This came out in 1987 by Hal Puthoff. He did a, uh -huh. a very important paper back then, and it's never been refuted. In fact, it's been referred to uh, many times as being absolutely 
top notch. Help had off said, okay, we've got a problem here, guys. If you take quantum theory, mm -hmm. you, you have an electron moving in an orbit around a proton, and according to quantum mechanics, it doesn't lose energy. However, according to classical electrodynamics, that electron should be radiating energy as it goes around in its orbit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it? And he pointed out that when you ask a physicist why it doesn't, he'll say because of Bohr's quantum condition. And then when you say to the physicist, ah, but what does the quantum condition mean? The physicist starts to fumble a bit. It's just an explanation that they don't know. But I mean, in fact, but how, what is the real answer? Of course, all these things are really just models that are imperfect. So as we press these kinds of questions on those kind of models, it just reveals that our models are frail, because there's an electron that revolves. It's really more of a stochastic behavior in the first place, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, Halpatov made a very interesting discovery here. He said, let's assume that the classical model of the electron radiating energy as it goes around its orbit is correct. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that's correct. And let's also calculate the amount of energy that that electron should be receiving from the zero-point energy background. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got it. He calculated the power that it was losing, he calculated the power that it was gaining, and the two happened to be identical. Mm -hmm. oh. So it's a balance. Mm -hmm. He made a very interesting comment. He said, without the zero-point energy every atom in the universe would undergo instantaneous radiative collapse. Which brings to mind, is it Colossians? Yes. Chapter, what, two? Yes. Uh, by him, all things are held together? Absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this huge amount of power that's there, Chuck, mm -hmm. power belongs to God. Here is a manifestation of God sustaining all things with the word of his own power. Mm -hmm. It's an absolutely... The, Nancy, look, this power, 10 to the 95 ergs in just one little cc, and you look out at the vast universe there, that, that is almost incomprehensible. Wow. To give you an idea of how much 10 to the 95 ergs is, if you take the amount of power being radiated by the, the sun and multiply that by 100, uh, 100 billion, for the number of, galax uh, number of stars in our galaxy and let them burn for one million years, the total amount of that energy expended would be approximately equal to that. No. 10 to the 95. Yes. Look at that. How great, how powerful, how wonderful is our God. Wow. It's absolutely stupendous. <laughs> it's quite a tour de force, my friend. That's actually you betcha. Now, okay. Well, well, I, want to, I, want, I want to work our way back to William Tift and his work. Yes, we're well, moving yeah, this yeah, direction. Okay, good. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so given, given that, given that you've got every atom in the universe sustained by this mm -hmm. zero-point energy, okay. um, you come back to the basis of your understanding of what the fabric of space is mm -hmm. and what is happening to atoms. If every atomic orbit is maintained by the zero-point energy, if the zero-point energy changed, okay. you would expect, perhaps, that the amount of energy in each atomic orbit might change. Sure. Okay, it'd have to to stay in balance, wouldn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is where William Tiff comes in. Tiff noted that the redshift of light from distant galaxies, well, the redshift for a start, as you have a look at light from the sun or light from other stars or light from galaxies, in that light you have a series of light and dark lines due to the emission of uh, light or the absorption of light by various elements in those stars. And these dark lines appear in consistent patterns, not only for our sun, but for other stars and for other galaxies. And, for example, sodium lamps, sodium vapour lamps, emit a very characteristic yellow light. And there is two, two dark lines in the yellow part of the spectrum which are very characteristic of this 
sodium emission or absorption. It's dark lines if, uh, uh, if sodium is absorbing the, the energy. All right, as you look at distant galaxies, it turns out that these characteristic lines are shifted progressively further and further and further down to the red end of the spectrum. That's called the red shift. Now, astronomers back in the early days, back in the 1920s, they assumed that this red shift was due to... The Doppler effect. The Doppler effect. As you hear a, you hear a, a siren on a police car coming towards you, it gets higher, then as it passes you, the pitch drops. Mm-hmm. And they said, OK, the same thing's happening with light. You call it Hubble's law after Edwin Hubble. And yes, Hubble's that's Hubble. right. This brings that's in... really, the whole thing's a conjecture, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they said, OK, they did some... Hubble did some measurements, and he said, look, the further out we go the worse this redshift gets. So obviously, these galaxies are going away faster and faster from us. So the whole universe must be expanding. And that is the basis of the expanding universe philosophy, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just this redshift. So they assumed that this was a a velocity effect until William Tift came on the scene in 76. Mm -hmm. Well, Tift, as he looked at these, as he looked at the redshifts of uh, light from distant galaxies, he noted something. It wasn't a smooth function. It was actually going in jumps. Discrete uh, quantum steps, in other words. Discrete, discrete quantum steps, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like every car on the highway is travelling at a multiple of five kilometres per hour. You put your foot down on the accelerator and nothing happens until you've put it down far enough and suddenly, bang, you're another five kilometres an hour faster. Mm-hmm. Unusual behaviour. And uh, how, how could this possibly... Well, you know what it can't be? It can't be the Doppler effect because you'd expect all values, not just discrete values. So you know exactly. it's some other phenomenology, right? Yes, exactly, Chuck. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, there's a lot of dispute about this to start with, and then the evidence started piling up. Of course, for some people, evidence doesn't really get in the way of their conclusions, does it? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a difficulty insight. <laughs> Which well, is fine, that's human nature, but it always amuses me how these physicists try to say science is objective when, in fact, they're just as emotionally committed to their traditions as the theologians or anybody else. So it's just the facade that I sometimes find uh, amusing. But getting back to the issue, okay, so we have Tift. Now, Tift hasn't come to conclusions about that. He just reports the discrete steps. That's it? right. Yes, yeah. he reports the discrete mm-hmm. steps. And uh, when the Hewitt Burbage catalogue was published in round about 83, Redshift catalogue was published around about 83, uh, it looked as if Tift was wrong because all of the, the values didn't show this clumping which Tift claimed was there. And then Tift and Koch noticed something. They noticed that if you subtract the movement of our galaxy and the, our sun in our galaxy, if you subtract that movement away from the redshift as a genuine Doppler effect due to our motion, if you subtract that away from all of these red shifts, you find that red shifts across the whole sky are quantized. Mm-hmm. They are going in the jumps. So it's, the, the data is modified by our own motion, you're saying? Our data is, the data is modified by our own motion. Mm-hmm. But once you subtract that out of the data, mm-hmm. you find that, in fact, these red shifts across the entire sky are clumped. Mm-hmm. Well, he started off with his clumping at uh, 72, roughly 72 kilometres per second. And redshifts are reported in kilometres per second uh, because they have assumed that the redshift is sure. a motion. Uh-huh. Um, they're actually, using, they're, well, using, they're impu- imputing the idioms of their conjectures, in effect. Yes, gotcha. indeed they are. Mm-hmm. What, in fact, the redshift is measuring is the change in wavelength gotcha. against okay. the laboratory standard divided by the wavelength. So the redshift Z is a pure number. So you're, measure, you're simply measuring the change in wavelength. And the further out you go, the greater the change sure. divided by your, your wavelength. So all right. So it's a, it's a wavelength thing that we're measuring, and it's a pure number. It's got nothing really to do intrinsically with velocity that we're measuring. Well, OK. Tiff then said he had noted a variety of other quantization figures. And up in, up in 1940, uh, 1991 around about then, 91 or 92, he noted that there was a basic quantization figure of around about 2.68 kilometres per second. Mm -hmm. That was the basic figure, which all the others were multiples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And he threw that at the scientific community, and I said, well, if you're going to have all of these multiple shift figures, how do we know if any one of them are genuine at all? And it came down to the, um, just a matter of, OK, well, statistically, he's right, um, but what can we do with this information? And it's been there, sitting there as a conundrum all this time. Now, if I, well, just to make sure we understand each other, this uh, basic number, whatever it is, 2.68, whatever, yes. it's, it, what you're saying is fractions of that never show up. It's always a multiple of that always number. Always a multiple which, of that which, number. Which implies a digitization, in a sense. It's a exactly. digital situation. It's it not does. an analog situation. Exactly. Which itself is, in, even in itself, is provocative. But go ahead. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is where we come back to the model of the vacuum again and the atoms. What we're looking at, as I said earlier, is a change in wavelength over the wavelength. This means that as you look back in space, the wavelength, the emitted wavelength of light from distant galaxies, from atoms in distant galaxies, because all light is emitted by atoms, this was actually emitted at a lower wavelength, a longer wavelength, which means a lower energy. A lower wavelength. A longer, a longer wavelength. I gotta think about that for a minute. There's, I'm not sure there's a lower wavelength, a longer, a lower energy. A longer wavelength. As you move down towards the red end of the spectrum, Chuck, you're moving down towards the low energy. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just okay. trying to. Okay. Okay. So if this light is shifted down to the red end of the spectrum in jumps, mm-hmm. it's um, what we're looking at we're, when we look out in space. We're looking back in time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, okay, back in time, the further back in time we go, the redder the light, the emitted light was. It was redder, redder, redder. At the lower energy. At the lower energy, yeah. So that's why I'm I'm puzzled, so sort of backwards. In other words, how are they picking up energy through time? That's my question, I guess. Yes, we'll come to the answer to that one. (laughs) All right, this is exciting. (laughs) Okay. What essentially we're seeing with the red shift is light emitted from these atoms Mm -hmm. is going... is as we look further out in space, is going to a lower energy uh, 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 for for each orbit. The further back you go in time, and it's going back in jumps. Oh, it takes lower energy per orbit. You're saying in effect, am I? Yes, that's right. That's right. Lower. What is each orbit in the atom is go as adopting a lower energy state. The further back in time we look. But it's doing so in the jump steps. Yes. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's now, like this piano keys. There's no intermediate tone. Exactly. Yeah, okay, gotcha. gotcha. Exactly. Okay. Now, this, is, this problem is something which a physicist is more, more familiar with because in the atom, just about everything goes in jumps. You don't have a smooth change in, uh, in energy from uh, one orbit to another. You have the, each. The best example is like a violin, which. On a violin string, you can add any tone depending where you put your finger. That's why it's discordant if you don't do it right. A piano, you can't hit a key and get a non-note. Mm-hmm. You see, that's sort of the idea. Just a, yeah. it's another way of looking. So that's the cool. atom is, in effect, sending notes. But they're always discrete. They may change relative, but they're discrete tones. That's what you're saying. Yes, exactly. And so, okay, then why? Okay, the question is why. Well, let's get back to Hal Padoff then. Okay. If, if the zero point energy background is maintaining each orbit energy what we're looking at is the orbit energy increasing in steps with time okay it makes sense that if you have an intrinsic amount of energy available to each orbit in the atom if that energy increases 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 gradually the atom can't access that energy until a full quantum of additional energy becomes available to the atom. Okay. Okay, because everything is quantized, it goes and jumps. You need a full quantum of additional energy available to the atom, and then it would click over to a new energy state, a higher energy state, where it's emitting bluer light, because blue is the higher energy end of the spectrum. We see, we see analogies of that when you see a little bar graph done with LEDs, where it's trying to show you a quantity, but you don't see any intermediate quantities. You just see if there's a row of 10 LEDs, three, four, five, or six are what are lit. It'll show you how loud it is or something, and and uh, it, you don't get a half an LED, half lit or something. You follow me? It's You're measuring things, but it's always in discrete steps, and that's what you're in effect saying. It, it won't show until it... 
Now, again, I guess I suspect in our heart of hearts, we really don't know why that happens. We just know it's true of all quantum behavior, whether it's length, mass, time, energy. They're all, that's the whole reason they call it quantum theory. Everything's in steps. Why they're in steps, we don't know, except the possibility that this whole thing is a digital simulation. But let's not get into that right now. Let's get back, <laughs> I want to get back to tip here. Okay. Yes. The, so that the, what I have done... Bohr, back in 1915, he, he showed that there were two equations which govern the behaviour of the atom. They call them the Bohr equations. Bohr quantised or put a quantum condition in one equation, which quantised the effective energy levels within any given atom. That was his con contribution. What I have done is say, OK, let's take the second equation and quantise that as well, and when you do that, it means that each individual orbit can take up a new energy level if sufficient energy is available to it from the zero-point energy background. That's all I've done, and the whole thing else falls out as a consequence of that, just by quantising that second equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, why then, why then should the, the, the ultimate question comes down, why should the zero-point energy be increasing with time? Because that's essentially... What it boils down to, if the if the light from the atoms is bluer, it means that the orbit energy is greater, it's greater right. with time. Why? Which means the zero point is increasing. It means the zero point energy yes. is increasing. Okay. Well, so that, 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 part, okay. well. that's, that, that is the ultimate question in this whole thing. I must also explain that if the speed of light, when the um, when the zero point energy is lower. Mm -hmm. the speed of light will be higher mm -hmm. okay. because it's like the fabric of space. Um, if I can express it that way. You might as well. Isaiah did. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The, uh, the fabric of space was thinner and light could get through more easily. It's okay. so fascinating that heaven is so, spo so often spoken of in the scripture as a scroll. He stretches the curtain of the heaven. You know, oh. Those issues. I'm not sure. It may, it may be a little too a little uh, too much license here to apply that to this discussion. But I do think it's interesting that um, uh, those terms, speaking of space, are used in the scripture. But go ahead, mm -hmm. Chuck. It's more than interesting because about eight to twelve times in scripture it talks about the Lord creating the heavens and stretching them out. Mm -hmm. Now, now, does this, this imply that they're starting to shrink then, or is that pushing it too far? Okay, let me just explain what the, the picture that we're getting from all of this. Up until now, scientists have said, okay, this red shift is a sign that the galaxies are fleeing away. But this red shift is quantized, it's going in jumps. There's the problem. If the red shift, in fact, is due to light being emitted from atoms at a lower energy level, that quantization that those jumps those quantum jumps in the red shift would have been smeared out if the universe was expanding or contracting can you understand that it means therefore that the universe the very fact that the red shift is quantized means that the universe must be static and back in 87 i think it was 87 89 um hoyle and nalika um, showed that a static matter-filled universe is stable against collapse. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we assume then that the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out and stopped. Mm -hmm. What does that do? Something very interesting. In the Big Bang scenario, at the time where you have massive inflation of the size of the universe where it's expanding out rapidly they say, they point out that this puts a stress or a tension or an elasticity into space the fabric of space becomes under tension or stress it's an elastic tension in the same way that you stretch out a rubber band that thing is under tension, under stress this is part of their equations and they say that that stress or tension should decay exponentially into another energy form 
which is radiation. Okay, I've taken that and said, we agree with that scenario. The Lord stretched out the heavens, created this tension or stress. It changes its form into specifically the zero point radiation okay. mm-hmm. exponentially. And this means that as, this, as with time, the zero point energy is increasing as this tension or stress from the universe is decreasing. No, it's a relief of that. Tension. And it is a relief, a release of that tension. So the zero point energy will increase with time as it increases with time beyond each quantum jump. The atoms are going to assume a higher and higher and higher energy state, and the speed of light is going to drop. Well, how does that relate to entropy and the bondage of decay, or does it? It possibly doesn't, Chuck. All mm-hmm. it does is say, okay, the Lord, in fact, has stretched out the heavens. Mm-hmm. It can't, in one sense, there had to be a certain amount of zero-point energy to start with to hold every atom in place. Otherwise, the atoms wouldn't be there. So as the stretching out process took place right at the very beginning, right at the very beginning, and Un- then... Unless this relief of tension phenomenon was somehow it's not necessarily intrinsic to the stretching it may be just a derivative of the, uh, the stretching which could, or maybe or maybe not be associated with the, the introduction of the entropy laws. The whole, yeah. I've been fascinated by the other equations that tend to look at entropy and light as reciprocals in terms mm-hmm. of Planck's constant or whatever else, but the point is that that intrigues me because the body that because of this passage in Romans 8 that some of the bondage of decay associated with the curse. Yes. And what yes. we know is the entropy laws. Uh, mm-hmm. And, of course, there are many scientists that really have a hang-up with that. They, they, they can't visualize the physical universe without the entropy laws working. Mm-hmm. So the, the proposition that they are derivative of Adam's sin, uh, they can't handle. My attitude is uh, they can't prove to me that Adam and Eve lived in only three dimensions. Who knows how they stood when they were clothed with light before they'd sinned mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. that's really way out there. So why worry yes. about that part of it? Yes. But we do know that there's entropy laws. We do know that we're subject to the body yes. of decay. And we do know that that's going to be somehow dealt with when we get in the Romans 8 passage. So, Absolutely. But I, and that may or may not relate to this, you know, the TIF thing and, and the speed of light flowing down. But I, I can't help but feel that there's a... There is that, a connection. That, that's all somewhere. connected, yes. yes. But that's, yes. that's um, an instinct more than an understanding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I would say that this release of tension had to occur very, very early on in the, uh, in the history of the universe. It, mm-hmm. Whether it was... At the time of the uh, of the fall, or whether it was before, I'm not uh, I'm, knows, not, I'm yeah. not prepared. Sure, sure. Scientifically, I would have to go right to the limit and say no, it had to be from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But Lambert would insist that no, it would be. Yeah, Lambert from, and I are probably you know uh, uh, drinking the same bathwater in terms yeah, of the. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this whole uh, this whole business is very interesting because this uh, with this quantization of the red shift. It means then you can predict what the size of uh, the speed of light was with each quantum jump. And with each quantum jump, the speed of light changed approximately uh, by 600 times its current value. And so with each quantum jump, the further out you go, the higher was the speed of light. So that right back at the moment of um, the creation of the universe, the speed of light was something like 2.54 by 10 to the 10th times its current speed. Well, it's virtually infinite, then. I mean, it's really fast. Well, it's not as fast as um, a recent paper by Ulbrich and um, Maguire. Um, they published, I think it would have been in February, in Physical Review. It was it received attention in uh, the London Sunday Times on November the 15th last year. That's uh, 1998. Uh, the headline was on the science page of uh, the uh, London Sunday Times: "Speed of light has changed." I saw that. I was very disturbed that these guys could even discuss the subject without even at least a backhanded allusion to your early declarations. Now, here you are. How, when was it that you first announced this in the public paper? Way back, uh, eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. So call it. Well, you know, more than ten years, twelve years ago. Um, and uh, creating all the controversy, taking all the flack and all the criticism and all the, the things, and uh, for someone to even address that subject and not at least at least make a token allusion, pro or con, at least allusion to your to to the very center of the subject seems to me a, a little crass. But in any case, um, the the very fact though that there are these kind of papers coming out even 
uh, willing to discuss the subject, I think in itself is an advance. It fascinates me that the speed of light was regarded as infinite up until you know from Descartes on until uh, Olaf Rummer did his famous thing, and uh, and uh, it took what uh, it, when he measured the speed of light using the the uh, eclipse of Io, and, yes. and so it took fifty years until Bradley, the Englishman, uh, confirmed his results. But for fifty years, the scientists, these objective super guys, were willing to ignore the evidence, uh, mm-hmm. to cling to their uh, preconceptions. Yeah. And so the fact that uh, you're catching a lot of flack and there's a number of people, uh, classical physicists, who sort of uh, uh, find it, uh, are incapable of somehow considering these kinds of things, and I put it that way because it's not as if they have real hard evidence, they just sort of react. Um, I think that's not surprising. It may not take 50 years, but I do I sense that the field of physics is no different than... It's tragic because the field of physics has been the hardest of our scientists because they have the theoretical physics audited by the empiricist. And so somehow it's had a history of little more solidity than other science uh, fields of science. But even here, physics is, is really a, 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 an emotional cauldron, particularly on this particular issue. So yes. I think that's, uh, that in itself is interesting. Or, uh, so. Well, Ulbricht and McGuire pointed out that uh, on their in their paper they had the speed of light 10 to the 60th times its current speed mm-hmm. at the moment of uh, uh, the mm-hmm. origin of the cosmos. And we're only 10 to the 10th, so I mean, we're, we're pretty conservative. <laughs> <laughs> and we're dealing, the other part of it, we have to be cautious here because we're extrapolating extensively from the rather limited data in terms of its precision, I think. So that's the other well, side of it. as far as the speed of light is concerned with the red shift, we can, we've got solid data essentially from the... Because uh, it's digital. It's part yes, of the yes. Yeah, it's, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. And so we can rely on observational evidence for this right back. We can trace we can trace the form of the curve right back to the very very early days of our universe, and the extrapolation involved in that is is very little to, mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. to to that figure. But uh, as far as the old Brick and Maguire paper was concerned, uh, someone on the internet uh, pointed out they said, well, he he didn't even mention Barry's name at all or Trevor Norman's if it came to that, and. Uh, they got a rather interesting response. Um, they, uh, the uh, response came back, Albrecht and Maguire are serious scientists. Setterfield is only a nut. It's ad hominem. See, it's got nothing. What, what the slur is is that he, doesn't have, he hasn't got his completed you know, PhD credential and so forth. And uh, I always regard, uh, uh, you know, I regard some of these credentials simply as an evidence of insecurity in the first place. And... Uh, the PhDs and the H2SO4s behind the name, whatever. It's, uh, so, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, it's interesting. I learned something else in a totally un- a different involvement. I was a, um, a chairman of the board of a, a uh, high technology company serving the defense community, and we happened to be in uh, very, very advanced uh, ultraviolet lasers, excimer lasers. And uh, the, the, the top genius in our little enterprise happened to be a physics PhD from the University of San, uh, University of San Diego, UCSD. And I, I, uh, this was unrelated to all this discussion. This occurred long before I was even aware of your work, Barry. But I do remember, for other reasons, he made the point that one of the exercises they give their PhD candidates is to, assuming the speed of light was not a constant, to derive the implications of that in atomic behavior. And it's really done as an exercise, not that they believe that's a possibility particularly, but to cause them to think through the ramifications of atomic behavior that depend on C. And, and uh, they, they have to competently derive. That was when I, I think, if, I think I, maybe it's on their orals. or But, anyway, but I remember he mentioned that because we were in another discussion that that's part of their test of do they really understand uh, what they should understand about the, uh, the whole area of subatomic particles, atomic behavior, the rest, how it all derives. If, the, if, the, if C increases or decreases, what's the implications? And I was very fascinated by that, because at least if nothing else, within that community, there's an acknowledgement of those interrelationships as being related, and, and thus becomes a, a, a chain of challenge mm-hmm. to the change of a constant. And I do understand, I haven't actually seen that quote, but I understand that uh, Einstein himself expressed doubt that there was any constant in the universe. I mean, he sort of reluctantly accepted light for a variety of reasons, but I get the impression even there he had his misgivings, if you will. Yeah. Well, that's uh, it's very interesting uh, just on this issue. Um, the discussion in the scientific journals continued up until August of 1941. And, uh, 41. Yeah. What happened in August was that two things. 
first of all, I was conceived. <laughs> Mum noticed this. Mum noticed this. this she, she considered this significant. But in that month, Artie Burge published an article which started by saying, this article is being written at this time upon request. And any belief in the change of the physical constants of nature is contrary to the spirit of science. And then he proceeded to lampoon the whole idea of the changing speed of light, and that effectively closed the discussion in the scientific literature. So, yeah, this article is being written upon request and at this time upon request. Any belief in the change of this physical constant of nature is contrary to the spirit of science. Tell me a little bit of how Alan Montgomery got drawn into this whole discussion. Where did that, is that through Lambert or is that... Uh, that was through Lambert, yes. Okay. He, uh, because uh, he's a Canadian statistician, isn't yes, he? Yes, Canadian correct? statistician, mm-hmm. yeah. And he did... Uh, after we'd done our initial stats on this uh, back in 87, uh, what happened there, Chuck, we had... I had some very good rapport with the maths department there at Flinders University through Trevor. We discussed uh, this with a number of the scientists there. And uh, the, uh, uh, the maths department were wanting us to put on a seminar about the whole issue. And um, that was about to proceed when, unfortunately, some creationists over in America made things very difficult for us. Mm-hmm. It was a real shame, really. Um, Lambert feels it's possibly because uh, they had not been able to get anything published in a secular mm-hmm. scientific journal themselves, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they were just a bit annoyed that mm-hmm. this had mm-hmm. some degree of credibility there. So it's human nature, and it's too bad, but okay. Yeah, but um, back in '87, when our report came out, it was very definitely through mm-hmm. uh, through mm-hmm. ICR that was that was the problem yeah, there, okay. and they there were ad hominem attacks there, of course, uh, but. They tried to attack the, the stats. Well, we'd done some basic statistical work there. And Trevor and I had a number of discussions with the professor of statistics down at Flinders University, and he said, no, you've done things correct, the correct way. Where Ardsmer and the others had pointed out other statistical methods should be used, the, stat- the, the professional statistician said, no, you are correct. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it is very interesting in all the pre- uh, ensuing argument, mm-hmm. these professional stat- uh, statisticians said we were correct, and it was the... The, it was the amateur Christian statisticians who were saying, no, it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. What I've seen in other areas, doesn't it all doesn't surprise me. It's disturbing that there's all these tension-creating activities that uh, within the Christian body that uh, seem to be so counterproductive. Uh, rather than competent secular attacks, it's really some of the these, as you put it, your amateur uh, internals. Not that, and again, the issue, uh, it's not a question of which is correct, it's a question of openness to the possibilities that always bothers me, you know? Mm-hmm. I think it's so foolish for us in some, in areas like this to be uh, dogmatic and, and, and it always, but yet it, 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 it disturbs me that there's this just basic emotional resistance. Well, but it is what it is and people are what they are. Now, uh, what do you think's the next step? Uh, what what do you see foresee coming down the pike and as a result of this? Uh, you've got some you've got some papers that you've you've provided us copies of, and I'll try to understand them in my limited thing. But the pre publication you've submitted these for publication. Do you have any yes. feeling for when this might when you might get this refereed or whatever? Okay, it's being refereed at the moment, as I understand it, Chuck. Uh-huh. Um, the the paper was initially sent to Foundations of Physics. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't even referee it. They bounced the paper straight back to me. Uh, without refereeing it. Without refereeing it. Yes, they didn't even referee it. They, uh, they didn't. The comment was, this, there are 43 pages in it. They said, this paper is not substantive enough or backed by sufficient evidence. And here am I with 100 equations uh, and something like 105, 110 references and 43 pages. Not substantive enough, not sufficient evidence for us to consider it publication in our journal. Well, the fact that they didn't even referee it makes me feel that, OK, it's probably too hot to handle. That was probably the problem. Well, must, are there alternative publications? Though, well, I, yeah. What I did, I, uh, I looked around and I saw that um, uh, it was journal of uh, uh, the Astronomical Journal uh, in, there in America. Uh, they have been publishing a lot of the results from NASA space probes and from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and this sort of thing. They're probably more open to new ideas than, than some. So I've submitted it to them, and as yet I haven't heard a response. They are presumably refereeing it at this stage. Mm-hmm. So I'll mm-hmm. get back to you and let you know what, uh, what okay. the reactions are there. 
have you thought about doing a little book? Going back to the history, some background, some historical thing, and in other words, make it so a layman can follow most of it, and, and put the more technical papers as appendices or something, but to do it as a, as a, as a book that, that might reach a market, and in fact might generate some some uh, more meaningful economic results. And well, as a result of the um, layman summary that I have put out to a few of my friends, mm-hmm. um, they have suggested that that should be the the basis of a book. Well, in fact. Before the um, 87 paper came out, I had already written about five or six chapters of a book about the speed of light, all the measurements that had been done, the way the experiments were conducted and everything else uh, on a layman's level. And so that is already sitting there. I can add into it from this point. I've always been mystified by the debate anyway, especially by guys like Hugh Ross, because anyone that has even a modicum of understanding of Einstein's general theory of relativity, and certainly Hugh Ross is incredibly competent in that area, mm-hmm. can easily duck the issue. Was the, was the universe created in, in six epochs, or was it 144 hours? You know, mm-hmm. And you duck that simply by whose clock are you talking about? If, if, if time varies with mass acceleration and gravity, whose clock are we talking about? Adam wasn't around, his clock wasn't running, mm-hmm. and you're talking about God, what's his mass and gravity? Come on, get serious. Um, Jerry Schroeder, uh, the physicist, in, the nuclear physicist in Jerusalem, good friend of ours, he has an interesting thing he does. He takes the mass of the universe, which apparently is estimatable and finite, he takes the mass of the Earth, he plugs them in the equations, which in effect says, here's an observer at the surface of the Earth, here's an observer at the perimeter of the universe, and he says, he put them in, and it turns out that the, the ratio is 0.061. Anyway, it turns out that the 15 billion years or whatever yes, turns out to be six days. Now, you know, it's a, it may be just a coincidence, and may be taking some liberty, but he's quite serious about presenting that as a thing. In fact, he presented that in the uh, Jerusalem Post, or one of the uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, papers there, and a friend of mine over in, uh, in Tel Aviv wrote and said, Hey, Barry, answer this guy. Mm-hmm. So I, I sent an answer back uh, in a letter to the editor. I said, he's got the right idea here, but uh, he's using the red shift and the, uh, uh, to give you, uh, give you the age of the, uh, the, the universe in actual terms. But I said, he's, what he's done in one thing is that. What I'm doing is something slightly different here. Sure, sure. And there is a, there's a different, uh, different interpretation. And when you take this difference in interpretation... Uh, you, get, you come out with a, a very similar result, sure. but, it, but it, instead of the, the whole cosmos being, in fact, uh, 15 billion years uh-huh. in actual time, it's only sure. six 6,000 years in... Well, I think Jerry, in fairness to him, if he was here, would agree, uh, you know, he advances the argument in seriousness. What he's really doing isn't advancing that as an argument cosmologically. What he's really doing is kicking the anthill to rec- for us to recognize yes. that you're dealing with two different time frames. Yes. And uh, so whether it, what the, the problem we have is not Genesis six days. The problem is Exodus twenty verse eleven. Mm-hmm. God clearly intended us to understand Absolutely. those literal days. That's our problem. It is. And uh, the, the, you're right. You know the, the epoch issue doesn't compute for a lot of reasons, mm-hmm. but that's subtle and takes a little more sophistication. The real problem isn't Genesis one and two. The real problem is Exodus 20, verse 11. Because God, for whatever reasons, clearly intended us to understand that, uh, to view it. In, in and I, I actually used that uh, that one in my uh, letter to the editor in, in a uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, I said, surely Israel, of all peoples on earth, should understand the significance of the Sabbath in, in, uh, in, uh, in the context of Genesis 20, verse 11. Mm-hmm. And I said, under those conditions, um, Gerald's argument just cannot hold up because mm-hmm. uh, he, he he doesn't see it, at least on the presentation that he gave there, he didn't see the Sabbath as a, as a literal seven days. He was looking at this as a, as a period of many, many millions of years. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, so, yeah. You see how that was created for the benefit of man. Exactly. Well, we have to leave now uh, the interview with Barry Sutterfield. It was nice that Nan was also with us because as Barry would turn in tutorial asides to her, I'm sure there were remarks that were useful for our listeners to keep us, Barry and I, from getting down uh, too technical uh, labyrinth of some kind. So that was a very special time for me. And I also should mention that uh, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, Jerry is, uh, lives in uh, Jerusalem, is a dear friend. He also was kind enough to endorse our book Cosmic Codes, Uh, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity. Uh, Jerry's a good friend, and his writings in this area are also extremely provocative. What is interesting, you may recall from the other tape, the tape one, we talked about Erev and Boker, not as later coming to mean evening and morning, but originally meant 
uh, dealt with the changes of entropy. And it's interesting that there is no Erev and Boker or evening and morning mentioned with respect to the seventh day on the Sabbath. Why? Because there was no entropy change. God is resting. And so this whole area, of course, is extremely interesting uh, to me, and I hope was to you. And the opportunity to actually hear from Barry himself was a very, very special treat. Uh, candidly, he and I went to dinner, and we had many hours in the evening just to, to wrap on this and related uh, discoveries. But I do hope you enjoyed it, and uh, hope this was edifying and gave you another insight, a possible insight, to the reality that uh, the Bible communicates to us. 